Visual impairments and blindness carry significant personal and societal burdens, ranking among the top 10 causes of disability in the United States. The Fox Family Foundation is dedicated to tackling the intricate relationship between poverty and vision loss. Tall Talks is pleased to introduce Lee Fox, the president of the Fox Family Foundation. This organization is working to address the complex connection between poverty and vision impairment by supporting initiatives that facilitate fair access to culturally relevant eye care services, offer academic assistance to low vision students, and advocate for workforce diversity, accessibility, and inclusion. The Fox Family Foundation firmly believes that forging strong partnerships and fostering collaboration with a diverse range of organizations is pivotal in advancing eye health and fostering a more equitable and just society. We look forward to hearing more from Lee Fox in Tall Talks. Um, so it, it's true, everything you just heard on that video is absolutely true, but I'm going to tell you a little bit, once the presentation comes up, that what uh, Fox Family Foundation obviously is a venture capitally, venture <laughs> philanthropy and grant making organization. All right, and at the heart of what we do, we seek to change lives, just like everybody in the room here that's been presenting. And what I want to talk about is how we might be able to build a more equitable society through visionary and inclusive innovation. But before I even describe what that means, I want to wind back the hands of time, because the truth of the matter is, is where I started, if I go back to 1999, I was a first-time mom. And Prior to that, I had been working at a technology company. We've been innovating in mobile application solutions. We were really considering ourselves at the forefront of new technology. Right when the internet was being born, there comes my daughter, and I somewhat go, oh, do I stick with my career or do I go into family? I got so captivated by youth, youth culture. And at the time, as you know, Gen Y is activating all over the place with different innovations. And I thought, my goodness, why is this? And what it comes down to, what I thought it came down to, was we had the rise of cost marketing and corporate social responsibility initiatives that were just being driven through these new digital media channels. And if you remember, these, these millennials born in 1981 to 1995, they were also growing up alongside the MDGs, which meant that all of those messaging helped them understand why what they did, such as a low-cost Braille device by a 12-year-old, was something that could actually be innovated upon and celebrated. And now here we are in this new youth activism era with the SDGs, right? And we're still seeing the same behavior. We've got Gen Zs who are being born um, in 1996-2010, and we all know who Greta is, right? She's become the face, the face of climate change, right? And that happened when she was 15. And even with these younger generations, the alphas, you've got a 10-year-old in Queensland who helped her community ban plastic bags. And so I thought, wow, again, why is this happening? Well, there's big commitment into um, uh, service learning, which has always been sort of in, in our schools. But we started activating more and more learners and teachers to get excited about that between the, ages, uh, between the years of 2000 and 2018. And again, if you think about the age of the millennials, the age of the Gen Zs and the alphas, this has been their life experience in terms of their educational experience. And so now we'll get back to the Family Foundation, the Foss Family Foundation. We do seek to break the link between vision, loss, and poverty. And even though that seems like a very narrow niche, I have to tell you that the more I dug into that conundrum, I realized that while it may not seem like the biggest problem in the United States, because we have so many bigger problems, if we want to call those, these, you know, compare in the world, it is actually surprising. By, by show of hands, by the way, how many of you have had an eye exam in the last year? Oh, some savvy people in the room. Good job. Because we are experiencing significant vision loss in America. So the CDC, said, the CDC is saying that if you are born um, between the ages of your birth and 18, in 2018, 5 million of you had significant vision loss. But for working age populations, it's 23 million. I think that that number is rather staggering. Significant vision loss, by definition, means that even through the deployment of glasses or contact lenses, you still cannot see well enough not to rely on something like 
an accessibility uh, support system, okay? So obviously we know that the, the older populations will continue to rise in numbers, but did you know that by 2050, 2050, we're supposed to double those numbers? Double them. Now the crazy thing about doubling those numbers is it's probably not gonna affect most of the people in this room, but it will affect the people that are the most impoverished, right? So 16 million Americans right now are functioning with a vision impairment that they don't necessarily even realize. And if they don't address it, it will go down to that significant vision loss. And most of the people, um, given that 80% of vision impairments are preventable, we don't have to have a problem of significant vision loss. So really what it comes down to is properly communicating to cultures or populations of people that are not actively going in and seeking health care for their eyes. As it, as it uh, happens, it's the black, Hispanic, and the poor adolescents that are the most deeply affected in these ways. So, a family foundation or nonprofit organization, we have a tool called the Theory of Change. Most of us in this room understand what that is. Basically, it's a framework or a blueprint that we can use to consider all of the assumptions that we might um, understand or think we understand about a problem. And then what we do is we say, what are the detriments? In our case, since vision loss is a health issue, we think about the social detriments of health. And first, that means low educational attainment or uh, inaccessibility to get your access for transportation or poor access to health care. But all of these different things, you can't as an organization, especially a new one like ours, go ahead and say, oh, we're just going to address all of them. So we settled on two. The first one we settled on was visionary scholars. This is the idea that we could potentially take low-income and high-promise youth and put them into careers that doesn't necessarily demand that they go through a four-year education, a uh, higher education program. Not that we don't want them to get there, just that it doesn't have to be immediate. Because coming from high school with low skills and stepping into a job means that if you're, you're not likely going to break through that poverty line that you're already at. So how might we step them into more lucrative careers? So we ran a program where we, where we brought lower income students, some of them dual language by the way, to take on courses that adults were taking at the same time. And what we were doing was measuring, could these young people still learn and um, react with the same information that their older adult counterparts would? And the answer was absolutely yes, they could. Um, and this was extremely exciting for us because we hadn't seen a program like this um, yet developed. The second area that we focused on was exceptional scholars. And that is taking people who are blind or low vision and putting them into the workforce by upskilling them. Now, over half of the BVI population that could be in the workforce are not, and those that are, about 32% of them are only given part-time employment. All right, so there's two things called DEI. One is called the Disability Equality Index, and one is the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Movement. And we were so excited because these two things have been so prominently talked about inside of our larger corporations, and we thought, surely, upskilling youth and bringing them in and upskilling BVI candidates would be an easy way to enter into the workforce. But alas, we are just not going to understand success unless we feel a little bit of the failure. And we really had a persistent pushback on our theory of change. And we were like, why? Why? Real equality isn't possible if we don't celebrate our differences. That's part of the problem. Real equality isn't possible unless we put what? All of us at the center. Inclusion at the center. And then we thought about this a little bit more deeply. We need to innovate for inclusion. So what are we going to do? Are we, gonna, or are we going to approach all of the incumbents and say, guess what, guys? We've got to change things here. Don't, don't think about accessibility as something that you have to do in hindsight. That's expensive. Let's think about how we might innovate for inclusion now. And it started to come back. Wait a minute. The youth. The youth they are going to be more open to the possibility of, of inclusion. So in uh, the summer of 2024, we are launching a program called Envisions. It's activating youth between the ages of 14 and 20 to 
understand concepts not just of human design, but of universal design principles. Because right now, universal design principles are not being integrated at the K through 12 level. They're only being integrated at the university level, and by that, it's very thin integration. Those principles basically ask, as you think about innovation, how might we include people that are different than us? But at the core of this is the pushback and the reason that we're going into youth is that the reason that people were not excited about bringing on new people who, who were extremely younger or disabled is because there's an inherent and an unconscious bias that exists inside of our uh, landscape of employment. And the only way that we get rid of that is to activate a generation that might be interested in looking at their own unconscious biases and really thinking about it meaningfully. And that is what the Envisions does, is it empowers the individual to consider how they might be innovators and be meaningful to industry right now through new innovations and new methods of inclusion. And it's also going to unlock the possibility for one billion other people to be improved, uh, included in some of societal's most Im important um, opportunities and so social structures. Um, and so the six trillion dollars that remain untapped, honestly, in most innovations, have the potential to be unleashed. So when we think about um, what in, in the Envisions uh, competition is going to do, we're giving them five design prompts. Can you make equi equitable spaces that eliminate physical barriers? Can you provide systems of lifestyle inclusion that increase social participation? Can you make empowered employment plausible so that you embrace diverse abilities? And can you build support systems that promote independence and most importantly, can you bring in adaptive technology that empowers new capabilities, not just for the disabled community, but for all of us? Because all of us, at some point as we age, are going to have experience a form of disability, one way or the other. It's not just about others, it's also about us too. You know, measuring success is one of, uh, is one of the hardest things for organizations to do, right? And it's the only way to unlock dollars. We firmly believe that Envisions, as just one initiative that we are going to do, is going to help unleash the and decrease stigma and social isolation, and of course, increase employment. But we are not abandoning all of the other things that Fox Family Foundation is focused on. And that's why we'll continue to increase rates of cultural, culturally incompetent workforce and you know, increase rates of graduation. Um, all of these are important to us. And finally, the call to action for the room is if there's anything that we have been doing in Envisions or the other areas, we invite you to participate. I missed out on a really key important piece in one of the slides that I was talking, and that is as the youth are innovating towards solutions, we've actually built a network and are building a coalition of uh, disability justice experts as well as members of the disability community to come and serve as mentors. Because there is a slogan that it is nothing for us without us that disability communities talks about, and we believe that is so critical. There's such an ego in the word entrepreneurship when we don't think about all of the other people that we are innovating for. We don't have the answers alone. We only have the answers as a collective. And I believe that that is uh, one of the ways that Fox Family Family Fox Family Foundation has differentiated itself. We've made a very, very firm commitment to collaboration, and we're very deeply proud that almost every grantee that we've ever given a grant to or invested in has found a way to cross-collaborate with another grantee. So if you belong, please contact me through these channels, and we would welcome your participation. Thank you so much.